Hello everyone. For this episode of uh, Video Game Book Club, we looked at Console Wars by Blake Harris. I really love this book. I had read it earlier about a year ago, and I just really wanted to do it again for this, just simply because it's a story that I really enjoy, and also I, you know, I just really enjoy, really like the book as well. It's something that, uh, it, it's a story that really sort of affects me because I was growing up at this time and I really didn't uh, realize everything that was going on. I knew about the rivalry between Sega and Nintendo. I kind of saw it on the playground a little bit, particularly from one of my friends who did not, he didn't own a Sega Genesis and I don't think he had really, if he had played one, he probably didn't play it as much. Growing up, Everybody on my block had a Sega Genesis, except for me. I just had my regular Nintendo. It was kind of weird. I, I saw everybody get everybody got a Nintendo around the same time, and then a bunch of my friends moved on to the Sega Genesis, and we got a computer. So I never really, never really played uh, Genesis at my house. I had to go over to my friends to play it. I didn't get mine until uh, probably. 99 or 2000 was when I got mine, but that's a totally different story altogether. So in Console Wars, uh, Blake Harris follows the story of Tom Kalinske, who was the CEO of Sega of America at the time. Uh, the book covers roughly 1990 to 1995. We do get a little bit of backstory in sort of like how Sega had been marketed before this, and also a little bit of Tom Kalinske's career prior to coming to Sega. He had worked at Mattel, uh, worked a little bit on video games at, at Mattel where they were just starting out with their handheld consoles and everything like that. He didn't really get to, get to market the Intellivision at all. I think the Intellivision might have been a little bit different if Kalinske had had a chance to really get into it, but he had moved on to other parts of Mattel at that time, and eventually I think he made it up to uh, be president of Mattel or like joint president of Mattel. It's one part of the book that I don't exactly remember a whole lot about, and it's not overly important for the rest of the story. Anyway, when Kalinske got in, Sega didn't really have a lot of like the really well-known games that you would think of, at least back in 1990. Personally, I had never heard of the Sega, Sega Genesis before 1990. I hadn't heard of the Master System when it came out. Uh, I first found out about Sega in, it had to have been like mid-91 when uh, Sonic came out. I, I get my dates a little bit messed up, but it was probably 1991 when I first heard of it. Most likely because my friend got a Sega Genesis. It usually... It must have been after the price drop, because once Kalinske came in, kind of got his bearings, he immediately came up with a plan to drop the price of the Sega Genesis from about, I think it was like $190 down to $150, uh, take uh, Sonic the Hedgehog and package that with the, Seg with, Sega Gen with the Sega Genesis. Gosh, sorry about that. Before that, the pack-in game was Altered Beast, and it's a fine game, but it's not, it's not Mario. It's not the game that you would probably want as a pack-in game. Uh, Sega would make that same mistake again with the, with the Sega Saturn, where they packaged a Virtual Fighter in with the Sega Saturn. It's a fine game, but it's not something that you would really would want as a pack-in game. You kind of want like a platformer or something that sort of shows off what the system can do. And unfortunately, Altered Beast really didn't do that. It, it, again, it's a fine game, I like it. It's a nice arcade port, but it's not Sonic the Hedgehog. And one more thing I wanna point out, what Sega did early with the Sega Genesis, and also they did this with the Master System as well, uh, they did a lot of arcade ports of basically their arcade games, they would bring them to the home console. And that was something that Nintendo had done as well, but Sega was really banking on that. They did a ton of arcade ports, and 
they're kind of hit or miss. If you look at the launch lineup for the Sega Genesis, it's not really that great. You have Altered Beast, Last Battle, Thunder Force 2, Super Thunder Blade, Tommy Lasorda Baseball, um, uh, Space Harrier 2. Sorry, I've got like, got like my wall of games over here. Uh, so it's not a great starting lineup. It got better, but they didn't really have that killer app until Sonic the Hedgehog. And also like some of the other games that came out as well. Uh, so you go into this is a pretty marketing heavy book but it doesn't it doesn't really uh, seem like it's super boring or anything like that it moves along at a pretty quick pace there is a f there are a few problems with the dialogue in it it he uh, Blake Harris basically had to recreate a lot of the dialogue and it's not always great but it's fine for what it is, mostly like the information I cared about. I could really have cared less what people are saying. So you see a lot of the differences between Nintendo and Sega, where Nintendo is more uh, kind of set in their ways, like we had 90% of the market with the Nintendo and that's just going to keep going. It was kind of a bit of arrogance on their part, which came back to sort of bite them in the ass a little bit. And with Sega, they were always trying to, let's do the opposite of what Nintendo's doing. Nintendo's going for family-friendly, we're going to go for, like, that teenage market. And that's kind of how I experienced the Genesis, was sort of when I was moving into my teenage years. I was looking for something a little bit, uh, a little bit more adult, a little bit more graphic than uh, the Nintendo was. Nintendo was fine, and I really liked it. I think Nintendo sort of gets a bad rap for being overly family-friendly. They are family-friendly, but they do take, like, a few chances, and most of those come from, like, the third party. You don't really see Nintendo doing, you know... They don't really do Splatterhouse, or they didn't really... They were not going to do um, House of the Dead or something like that. Uh... It's kind of weird the way they did things when they brought games over to the United States. They would do a lot more censoring than Sega would. And it's just sort of, it's one way that they sort of show how Sega did things differently than Nintendo. Uh, there are a few major themes in this book. I'm going to touch on two of them. One of them is the uh, sort of growing friction between Sega of Japan and Sega of America. You would think these two would be working like in conjunction, like if Sega of America was doing something that was really successful, Sega of Japan would kind of copy that. But you have the opposite effect, where you can see there's a lot of animosity growing between Sega of Japan and Sega of America. The better Sega of America does, the more resentful Sega of Japan seems to be. And it's explained kind of that uh, Nakayama, the president of Sega at the time, was really pushing like Sega of Japan, like, hey, what does Tom Kalinske think about this? And you can see how that kind of ruffled feathers with uh, Sega of Japan. They stopped really listening to the advice that Sega of America was giving them. Uh, it, it was very, very weird where Sega of America wanted to do this global release for Sonic 2 called Sonic Tuesday. and. Sega of America, Sega of Europe, both were like, great, let's do this. And Sega of Japan said, no, we're going to release it when we want. And it kind of messed up like the global release of it a little bit. Not to the point that it would derail the game, but it was just sort of weird the way they did things. And then later on when they had the 32X, and Sega of America was pretty against it, which rightfully so, they should have been against it. It was just a bad idea from the start not from like a spec standpoint of increasing the power of the Sega Genesis, but just how close it was to the Sega Saturn. It was just very weird that they did this, where they released this add-on, which was like a $200 add-on, a year before they did the Sega Saturn, and then they bumped up the date for the Sega Saturn. So the 32X comes out, and this is the only peripheral for the Genesis that I have, like, any real childhood memories of, because one of my friends got it. 
And I don't know when he got it. It must have been after, you know, everybody gave up on it and the prices started falling. But he got it, and it was just kind of like, okay, great. I mean, it had Doom on it, and it was okay. I mean, it was Doom on the console. I wasn't really expecting much, but when I would go back to the PC version, that's when I would really see, oh, okay, this is not anywhere near as good as the PC version. Uh, it, and that's, I think, the only game that I ever remember playing on the 32X was Doom. I don't remember any of the other games. And it had a very small uh, collection of games. I think it's about 40. I don't, it's probably not more than 50. I think we only got 40 games in total. Uh, one thing they do talk about is the marketing of the 32X in here. Or, sorry, the, the uh, Sega CD in here. They do go into the 32X as well, but the... Sega CD is another one I wanted to talk about. I never heard of this thing growing up. And I'm just one person, but this was a system I had never heard of growing up. And it had about 140 games released here in the U.S. Uh, it might be a few more than that, somewhere between 140, 150. And I've got one now, and I've got a bunch of games for it, and I really wish that I had that thing growing up, because... It, one, it should have been its own system. It didn't need to be an add-on for the Sega Genesis. If they had released that and said that was going to be the stopgap between the Sega Saturn and uh, the Sega Genesis, or sorry, the stopgap between the Genesis and the Saturn, that would have been fine. But I don't know what the hell happened. It was sort of like they gave up on it or something like that. It also didn't help that it was the same price as the Sega Genesis, or actually at that point it was more than the Sega Genesis. So you have to drop 150 bucks to get the console, and then you have to spend another 200 to get the Sega CD. And it, it's just, it was just a really dumb, dumb idea. It was fine for the time because you wanted to see them sort of put like this next forward, be like, hey, this is what games on CDs are gonna be like, and they're gonna be awesome. And they were, for the most part, they were pretty good. It has its duds on it, but every system has some, like, several games that are just crap. But for the most part, it's got a lot of really great games. And I wish that I had it growing up. I wish I had, you know, had more experience with it. But unfortunately, I just, just didn't. And that was kind of the problem with uh, some of these peripherals that Sega had. And it goes back into how Sega and Sega of Japan were just really at each other's throats. Not so much my own personal story, but just how these things were marketed. Uh, the second major thing that I wanted to talk about was the relationship between Sony and uh, Sega and Sony and Nintendo. Both companies end up kind of flirting with uh, Sony on making one a CD add-on for the Super Nintendo and also sort of jointly marketing a uh, home console. Now, at the time that it started with Sega, they were already well into the development of the Sega Saturn, and they didn't want to throw out everything that they had done, so they spent, I believe the book says, six months with Sony trying to figure out a way that they could kind of combine the Saturn and the uh, Sony PlayStation into one console. And that sounds like a really cool idea. I mean, you have the Sega Saturn, which... Uh, from some of the other books I've read, it was like a cutting-edge 2D game, or sorry, 2D console, and the Sony, which was a fairly good 3D console at the time, I mean, at least for mid-90s, it was pretty good. And if you put those together, you would have had something that was pretty good. It would have made your uh, Sonic the Hedgehogs, the 2D games, look really great, and it would have done a pretty good job up for uh, 3D games. At the time, it did a great job for 3D games. Now, when you look back at some of those early titles, it's like, okay, I, I kind of see what you were doing, but um, yeah, this doesn't look that great. It's sort of a weird thing where they just didn't age as well as some of the some of these 16-bit and some of the 2D games that were out at the time. Uh, that being said, Sega of Japan really just kind of shat on the whole possibility of a relationship. Sega of America and Tom Kalinske were all for it, because Kalinske had built up quite a few relationships, but specifically with Olaf Olafsson, who was kind of running the uh, development of at least the software part for Sony. And he also really, really was, 
really felt uh, strongly about the Sony PlayStation. And that's Sony getting kind of uh, cast aside by both uh, Nintendo and Sega. It really kind of spelled like, not the downfall of both, but definitely the downfall of Sega and kind of the diminishment of uh, Nintendo for the most part. You saw the PlayStation sell 100 million consoles, you saw the Sega Saturn, I, I don't know how many they sold here. It sold much better in um, in Japan, but here it just it did not sell that great. I remember seeing it, uh, gosh, I, I could not tell you how much it was actually selling for, but I remember seeing it in my local store probably in like 99 or so and just thinking to myself oh yeah Sega made that and just moving on when I bought my first console which was a Sony PlayStation that was the first console I bought with my own money I never even considered buying uh, the Sega Saturn because like one I didn't know any of the games that were coming out for it and I just didn't really care about Sega at that point, which is kind of sad looking back now, because I really love the Genesis. I just don't care about the Saturn that much. And they did have a lot of really good games come out for it, but they did like a really weird thing here in the US where they were like, we're only going to release five star games. And this was after Tom Kalinske left. And I think if he had been there, he wouldn't have done something this stupid. Where he's like, we're only going to release the five star games here, and five star games for the, for a bunch of grumpy old people that were running Sega at the time, they're not the same as somebody my age. So they didn't release all of like the really amazing games in, that were in Japan. They didn't release those here in the U.S., which is a real shame. But it's just sort of what happened, and oh well. Uh, also, they. They had Virtual Fighter pack as a pack-in game for the Sega Saturn, and that just makes no sense. It's a fighting game, it's not going to appeal to a large amount of people. That's kind of what you wanted out of a pack-in game. Of course, those are kind of now... A, the launch title pack-in games are kind of a thing of the past, which is a little sad, but you know, it's the way it is now. So, yeah, that's kind of the entire story of the book. Unfortunately, Kalinske kind of got pushed out of Sega, and, uh, you know, he, he, did a, he did a really amazing job at Sega, and created a lot of, or at least helped to create a lot of really memorable things, like the Sega Scream that was big in the 90s at the end of every game, uh, sorry, at the end of every commercial, and it was on quite a few of the games as well. Uh, it was just, they did a lot of crazy things. The he he's not the one that came up with blast processing but he sort of helped that come about and that commercial was uh, the commercial of blast processing where the uh play the um tv is attached to a drag racer and it's playing sonic the hedgehog and the tv is attached to and there's another tv attached to like this old milk truck that's playing i think it was mario kart or super mario world and they're sort of like visually explaining what blast processing was to somebody. In all honesty, it just means that the console runs a little bit faster. It really didn't change anything. And when you look at like, and I'm not a fan of technical specs, but when you look at the technical specs of the Genesis and the Super Nintendo, the Super Nintendo is way ahead in like everything. Mostly because it came out a couple years after Sega, after the Sega Genesis. And that was another weird thing that happened with Sega. They would sort of jumpstart things technologically, but the other companies were doing R&D much, much. It was I don't know if it was better or if they were putting more money in it, but like their R&D facilities, they were just they would just seem to like vastly outperform anything that Sega did. So Sega released the Sega Genesis, and it's much better than the NES. But then two years later, the Super Nintendo comes out, and it just is way, way more powerful and sounds a lot better than the Sega Genesis does. I don't really know how that actually happened, but, you know, it, it's just sort of... Uh, 
sort of a weird thing. Sorry for going on a bit of a tangent there. Anyway, this is a really awesome story, and I, I cannot recommend this book enough. If you were growing up in the 90s and you didn't quite know everything that was going on, but kind of behind the scenes with uh, Sega, Nintendo, and Sony, definitely get this. It is a great read. It doesn't take that long to get through it, uh, but overall it's just a wonderful book. So the I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys next, uh, I'm probably going to have this book done by next week, but uh, my next book is going to be Adventure, uh, the Atari 2600 at the dawn of console gaming. So far I'm really loving this one. It is done by Jamie, I'm just going to totally butcher his name, Ladino. And I'm really, really loving it so far. It's a very quick read, so I'll probably get this one done uh, maybe next week or something like that. But don't hold me to that. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the, this episode, and I will talk to you next time. Have a great day.